out, all right? And this class should be an aliyah to the neshama of Chai Yehudis Gittel, Bas, uh, Bas Chai Meir Leib, okay? That's who okay, to our wonderful Jody and to all the other beautiful women, um, Mrs. Hochman and Mrs. Hartman and um, Anita Friedlander, so many other beautiful women. It should be an aliyah to all their neshamas. Okay. So I actually like this idea of learning Hallel. Does anybody know anything about that prayer Hallel when you say it, anything about it? Is it in the morning prayer? Okay, so interesting. It's not really an, a morning prayer. It's a prayer that we say very specifically. So it's that's what's good to know. There is lots of halalukas. There are a lot between Ashrei and by Yivarech David and Oz Yashir. But specifically, Halal is a prayer that we say. Does anybody know when? Anybody else? Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh. Excellent. Any other times that you know you say it? Shalosh Hagim. Yeah, the Shlosh Regalim, perfect. Okay, Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuot. We're going to, you know, go into the real detail about it. But Hallel is a very uplifting prayer, okay? So Hallel, the word Hallel means, does anybody know? What does the word Hallel mean? Anybody know? It means Thanks. praise, right? So it's praise or song. So it's a very meaningful prayer. It's a prayer where you're really like acknowledging Hashem. You're going to be asking for things. You're going to be appreciating. So there's like a real tefillah component and it's just very rejuvenating. So you say it like Rosh Chodesh and Rosh Chodesh means every new Jewish month. You know, like you see, they say, oh, we have to do the blessing of the Jewish month. And then when the Jewish month comes, we say Hallel. So what's so great about a new month? What is like the new month supposed to make you feel? New beginnings. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I kind of feel like we all need, right? We all need some new beginnings, right? And it's very beautiful. Like the Jewish people are like the moon, right? We wax and we wane and we start again. And they say specifically the Jewish woman is even more so the moon than anything else, right? We reflect the light of the sun and, and we have our body changes and we have renewal and every month. So it's very, very um, connected to us. And so this idea of celebration and rejuvenation and prayer, it's so beautiful. So we say Hallel, it's very interesting on what we call the major pre pre uh, holidays, minor holidays and the new month. Okay, so it's very interesting. I don't know if anybody here, anybody here go to Associated, Etzchayim, any of the Jewish schools? Okay, so I don't know if they did it in Associated, I want to ask you, but in Etzchayim and in like uh, Beis Yaakov, every month, the new month, we always had an assembly. Did you have an assembly in Associated for the new month? Like, okay, so we would get together and the whole school would pray together on Rosh Chodesh. And what would, I, I remember till today, it was like such a nice experience. And we would sing Hallel together. So you really kind of felt this collective Jewish soul, right? And singing all together, all the different grades, like, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, whatever. It was just like such a nice feeling. And I think that's what Hallel brings out. And it mimics like what Leora was saying, the idea of the Jewish people going up, like, like that would be amazing. Like all of the Jewish people, imagine doing a pilgrimage, all of us, like millions of people coming together to the base of Migdash to celebrate the holidays and to sing Hallel together. Like, it's such an infusion of inspiration, you know, like connectivity and inspiration. That's like, I, I feel like we need it so much, right? So you, you had that vibe of this collective soul. So Hallel consists of six chapters. Good for us to know. Okay, so the chapters in Tehillim that it exists, uh, consists of, sorry, is 113 to 118. Okay, and it's very interesting. You usually say Hallel right after you've said Shmona Esrei. So Shmona Esrei is a real high point in prayer. 
right? Like we said in prayer, you wake up in the morning, you start off like you have tumma on your hands, you know, you're still half awake, half asleep, you're more animal than you are soul. And by the end of Shemona Esra, you are ready, this beautiful malach, you stood still, you prayed to the Almighty, you recognized who he was, you asked him all your questions, you come back, you say, oh, say shalom, you're going to make peace, take me through the day. And then, boom, you get to say halal, okay? You get to even up it another notch. You get to be part of the service that once was in this holy temple. You get to really like rejoice and sing and praise. That's so beautiful. So when we say the word major holiday compared to a minor holiday, I want to tell you how we distinguish that, okay? So a major Jewish holiday, this is important for us to know, it means it was a holiday written in the Torah proper. Okay, so in the five books of Moses, it talks about these major Jewish holidays. So who knows what those major Jewish holidays that you hear about mamish in the Torah? Any ideas? Pesach. Amazing. Pesach. Sokas. Sokas. Amazing. Anything else? Shavuot. Shavuot. Rosh Hashanah. And Kippur. Yom Kippur. Woo! Okay, that's it. Stars are going out here. Okay, <laughs> put your sticker on your sheet. I'm so proud of you. Okay, perfect. So now there's minor holidays. That's very interesting, that word minor holidays. So minor holidays that are not written in the Torah, and one of which we say Hallel on that minor holiday. Sure <laughs> this is Han Hanukkah is one of them. Yes, it is Hanukkah! Amazing. Okay, Amita. Woohoo. Okay, so that is one of the minor holid holidays. It was not written in the five books of Moses. It was instituted later in Jewish history. They say either by the Anche Knesset Hagadola, which was the men of the great assembly, or by the great Jewish leaders at that time who were acting with a divine, like Ruach HaKodesh, like divine inspiration. Okay. So, and it's interesting because it says on Hallel, you should really like say it the whole eight days of Hanukkah. Okay, so very interesting. And the other minor holiday is Rosh Chodesh, which is the beginning of the new month. Okay, so it's not considered a real full holiday. And it was, um, it's just interesting for us to know. Okay, so it's not a real full holiday. So, Let's see, what do these chapters have to tell us? So when you look at from 113 until 118, what are they really expressing, okay? So a lot of it is joy, which is good. I think we need a lot of it now, okay? So I think right now, like I'm just continually hearing things that are not pleasant to hear. Do you know what I mean? And it becomes hard, you know what I mean? And when the world is changing so rapidly and it's it's not aligning with God's values and it, it's it's hard it's hard on your heart right it's hard on your heart so what do we know about Judaism Eve do es Hashem besimcha right we need to serve Hashem in joy so joy again is not like woohoo birthday parties you know jumping up and down joy means clarity okay that's what joy means I understand clarity, clarity, clarity. Clarity is sometimes bitachon. Clarity is, I may not get it, but I understand what he's doing. Do you know what I'm saying? That's also clarity. Clarity is, I know what I'm living for. And regardless of sometimes how my feelings, right, are making me feel, and that's okay, they're from the heart, right? And sadness and all these emotions are very real and they have a place. They just, aren't supposed to, you're supposed to harness them for the good, right? Love, sad, depressed, kind, whatever it is, we have to harness them, right? They're just energy in motion. So we do believe there's a time for them, but we always need simcha. We always need to put our brain to it, our thoughts to it, and always to know it comes from clarity. So yeah, it hurts, but I clearly understand that this was for the best. Still, it hurts, but I clearly understand that this was for the best. You know, I was, uh, 
uh, talking to somebody today who is from the school of hard knocks, like I cannot tell you, like people in their family have committed suicide. They, they have a very um, strong mental reality that leads to depression. Like they really, it's not their fault. Do you know what I mean? Like it's a chemical imbalance that's very severe, right? So it's interesting that how she was talking to me and she said like when she finds herself kind of losing it, she writes sticky notes all over the house with the words, ho du la shem ki tov, ki le olam chazdo, praise Hashem because he is good, um, ki le olam chazdo, because forever is his kindness, or ain od milvado, or all the, why is she doing that? Why is she doing that? Like she feels herself going down. Most people would be like, you know, her, her, she has a sister died of cancer, brother committed suicide, father, I think also like, it was like, you know what I'm saying? God forbid, right? Like, you know, you got to live with all this, right? So why, like she gets down, puts up all those little pieces of paper, all like little sticky notes. What's, what's the purpose of that? What's, what's she doing with her sticky notes? Somebody unmute ski because you guys are very smart. Okay. <laughs> I'm not letting you get away with this, okay? I'm you read, when you when you write stickies, you read it a couple of times. Yes. As you pass. That yes. Again, perfect, again. perfect. It's like an affirmation. She starts reframing. She starts putting her mind to clarity. It anchors, Talia, great word. It anchors your thoughts, okay? Perfect. So this is what's going on when we're saying Hallel. Hallel anchors your thoughts. That's what it's for. It's to give you clarity, give you joy, give you understanding. And it's very, very important because who's it coming from? Who wrote Hallel? Yes, say it. Someone's saying it. David HaMelech. Yes, David HaMelech. What do we know about David HaMelech and his life? It was hard. Yes. A lot of a lot of service, a lot of hardness. Like, you know, in some ways, like those are the people who inspire you. That's the concept of Jody. How did Jody inspire us? Because it wasn't a walk in the park. She didn't have a life that was a walk in the park. She had a hard life. And she always could smile through it and always could have be tough and always had belief in Hashem and only, you know, could see, well, no, don't think she never felt bad. You know, I would talk to her and suddenly she was down, but then she'd pick herself back up. So this is what you want to, you want like to associate yourself with these kinds of people because they teach you and they teach you from reality. Like it's very, very hard when, you know, you see people whose lives are, you know, pretty like, do -de -do -de -do -de -do, you know, and then you're trying to, you know, like you're, oh, I feel so bad. Why? What's the big deal? Get over it. You know what I mean, right? Like, so it's very hard for you to connect to these people and really take their words to heart. But here you can, and this is what I love. We have to memorize this thought, okay? Just as much as we're putting Hodu Lashem Kito, put this up. Whenever you say to Hillen, listen carefully. David Amelech says it with you, okay? So in the grave or in Olam Haba, whatever, okay? He's mouthing the words with you and listen carefully and becomes an advocate for you. So it's not just, he's like, you're going, you know, Hodul Hashem, Hodul Hashem. It's Hodul Hashem, look down Hashem and see who is doing the davening. So I want you to know this. It's a beautiful, beautiful idea. I love this idea. So you know how we always talk about the malachim, you know, we talked about the angels that we create and then we talked about the angels that God creates. And we said that the angels that God creates, they have a job. They sing to Hashem. Okay, but it's a job. Remember, Yaakov is fighting with Asav and Asav, of Asav's angel, and Asav's angel says, Let me go, let me go, I have to get up there because it was his turn to sing to Hashem. Okay, great. So the Torah tells you, you know, Hashem is sitting in his kisei hakavod, so to speak. He's sitting on his royal throne, so to speak. And what? The angels have this beautiful chorus of voices. And like Hashem, it's like anybody here ever been to one of these like phenomenal symphonies or listening, you know, to these radio stations. What is it? Beautiful music for a crazy world. Okay, right. Okay, so Talia's got her hand up. Okay, so we've listened to this stuff, right? And it's so beautiful. 
Torah tells you that Hashem is listening to this outstanding music from the angels. And you go, stop. And they're like, why? What? Because I hear someone saying to Helen, stop. The music of a human being saying to Helen is 10 times more beautiful than your music. Because your music, you have to do. Their music, they choose to do. That's a beautiful thought. You know, that's a beautiful thought. So that's what's going on when we're saying Hallel. So let's see. It gives you the, the, the themes that you're going to find in these different um, Psalms from 113 to 118. Okay. So one of the themes is the Exodus. Like you're going to see the themes that you're covering in Hallel are probably the most fundamental beliefs in Judaism. Okay. So the Exodus is one of them. The splitting of the sea, the giving of the Torah at Sinai, right? The future resurrection, the coming of Mashiach. Okay, so these are like, this is our history, okay? This is what creates us as a nation. This is what attaches us to Hashem. This is the great promise that we have. Now, it's tough. Okay, this is tough. We have been in exile for thousands of years. We're not talking a day or two. You know what? So, but we're at the end of the story. We're at the end of the race. You know, like when you see these people like climbing up the mountains, you know, people climbing up and climbing up and climbing up. And you just like the last bits, like, please, please don't give up. Right. And then there's these people just like, can't do it anymore. We don't want to be those people. You want to make it to the very end. You want to pass the torch on to your children so they can attach it on to the children's children. And it's Hashem, we're going to be there. Like, it's not like Hashem, is, there's not so much more left to the destiny of history. I think everybody sees that today. You know, somebody was talking to me and they're saying like, when they watch the news, they think they're watching the fall of the Roman emperor, empire, right? Like, and, you know, these crazy shootings that are going on, people going into malls with guns and just shooting people randomly, like stuff like this did not happen in our countries. You know what I mean? Like, instead of having terrorists, you're having real inner turmoil, you know, from people who are not well and no, no law and order. So like, we have to appreciate. So what we have to be thinking here is like, it's gonna come hold on. And when you're saying Hallel and Hashem is asking you, say it on all these major holidays, say it on all these times, the story of Hanukkah, like say it when it looked so down and dark and the Jewish people were lost and the base of Mikdash is destroyed and there's nobody, you know what I mean? And they're being Hellenist and they're going to assimilate and it looks like it's all gone. And then, whoa, you know, salvation comes and light comes. So say it at these times so you can hold on till the end. That's why it's talking about Trias and Mesim and all these things. Okay, so we're going to look at this and let's take a look on, you know, when we say it, when we don't say it, why? Okay, so if you take a look, you were right. Like I think it was um, Amita or Kathy that you said the holiday of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are holidays, major holidays written in the Torah. But we don't say Hallel on Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah. Anybody, you know, unmute and think why you wouldn't say Hallel on Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah? Any ideas? As Hallel is like, woohoo, yay, everything is great, happy, happy, happy. What's Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? <laughs> Repenting? <laughs> what, yeah, it's like judgment. judgment. <laughs> okay, it would not pass, the Torah tells you. It's not appropriate for a king who's sitting on a throne and it's a serious time of year, right? Like, so it's, it's very interesting. Like Rosh Hashanah, we play the game. We get dressed up, we eat a nice meal. Like we're kind of going there going, you know, Hashem, we're uh, feeling pretty secure <laughs> okay, that you're going to give us a very nice year. But <laughs> okay, we're not going to sing and dance about it yet. You know what I'm saying? Like we're a little more cautious, so to speak. So that's why on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you are not going to be, it's, it's serious. Like there's this, right? Sukkot, which is very beautiful. All the holiday of Sukkot, Shmini Atzeres and Simchas Torah, you're going to say the complete halo. Shavuos, you've got the Torah, amazing. So it's very interesting. You say the complete halal on Pesach, just the first two days. 
Now, this is really interesting, okay? That just the first two days, all the intermediate days, you don't say the complete halal. And on the last two days, you don't say the complete halal. So it's very interesting. You know, it's, it's funny for us to understand it. Like when I hear this, like maybe you'll, I guess I can get it. Let, we'll talk about it together. The Torah says, Hashem says, don't say a complete halal because on the last day of Pesach, Egypt was completely destroyed. And all of the last day of Pesach is the splitting of the sea and all of the soldiers and, you know, we're all drowned. So it's funny, like Hashem says, in some ways, I can't have complete joy when some of my creations are destroyed. So what is it? It's not that, because there's a part of us, like, let's look at it from another side, flip the coin. Like for me, it's like, hooray, because evil was punished. Why would justice, like it's justice, that's justice. So why would you still feel sad? So anybody want to unmute and think about that? It's a, it's a good question. Because Hashem is compassionate. You know. Right, because Hashem is compassionate. And, and I think it's not, the justice part, I think God gets. But I still think you're right, that it still hurts for him to have to punish. And I think... Uh, okay, and, and I think also, I think also, there's this great disappointment in all the potential that these people had. Like, I think we sometimes forget that there's mankind, you know, that God's not, obviously, yes, the world revolves around us, because you're the teachers, if you're the light onto the nations, but God wants to see the nations get the light too. You know what I mean? It's just interesting for us to think about it. Sandy's picking up her hand. So let me hear Sandy. You have to unmute. Put my microphone down. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So wasn't it Hashem talking with the angels and the angels were saying, why are these people better than these people? Because the Jews, the Hebrews in Mitzrayim were not necessarily such be well behaved. Yeah, they so were wonderful. doing idol worship, right? Just like everybody else. The truth is what happened, you know, what really got <clears throat> the seed to split was Yosef's bones. Because Yosef was so super incredible when he was 17 and this like Aisha's Potiphar this beautiful gorgeous woman they said she never wear the same outfit she changed her clothes twice a day just to like really get him Do you know what I mean and that he could have the strength like they say when anybody goes to heaven and they say something like I couldn't help it my secretary was just I couldn't help it so then Hashem says oh well you could have because you really have the genetics of you know, Yosef and so it's interesting what you're saying but just here's this concept I think that you know like Tashem it's painful when people don't reach their potential. I think it's painful for any of us, like when you have children who, you know, really get mixed up and messed up and they get into drugs and they lose the, do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not only about your personal, do you know what I mean? Like, well, that's my son, it's so embarrassing. Yes, for sure. But on top of it, it's like you, you have Rahmanis for them. Do you know what I mean? So it's almost like, you know, that's why Shem says, okay, you know what? The halal that you're giving, you're trying to give for me to feel really, comforted and lots of joy but there's a point here that I can't be that comforted when it comes to this day it's a little too solemn for me for the song it's like a very there's a, a depth to it you know what I mean like for all of us to understand right okay beautiful okay so let's see what else there was here because I thought it was just such beautiful things okay so partial ha um, halal which does not include so if you take a look you would see it like it would give you you know the verses one to eleven of Psalms 115 or the verses in completely Psalm 116. It just shows you the different things. Okay. So different like things. And you would see that in your sitter proper. So you don't have to, you know, worry about that. Okay. So let me see. Okay. So why partial um, Hallel on Rosh Chodesh? Like I wanted us to know this. Okay. So it was yeah, because really this concept of saying Hallel and making a big festival out of Rosh Chodesh was something that came later on in time, okay? And it was more of a minhag. It's interesting. It was more of a minhag. So 
later as it was being more developed they decided you know what we're not going to make it this whole big thing because it's not a it wasn't said so in the torah so we're going to give it a partial a partial hallel okay so now it's very interesting because what's another holiday that was really big like we always talk about hanukkah and purim purim it's interesting you don't say hallel at all on purim nothing and if you really think about it like it was a huge salvation like the whole jewish people were at risk we could have god forbid been the end of us so it's interesting what the torah tells you this is a good shout out for the land of israel they say because this did not happen in the land of israel it didn't merit a hallel the story of hanukkah happened in the land of israel so it's really like it's a good thing to know that sometimes do you know what i mean because sometimes like we live in a very, you know, chutzla aretz, and it seems pretty okay over here. And we sometimes like forget, no, there's really this extra kedusha in the land of Israel. Also, when Hanukkah happened, the ending was a much better ending. Like the Jews gained more independence and they weren't under Greek rule. But in the Purim story, it was a salvation from the enemy called Haman, but the Jewish people were still under Ahasuerus. Do you know what I mean? Like we weren't able, it wasn't this like bigger redemption. So it's very interesting that for those two reasons, you don't say hello and Purim. And I used to always think about it. Anybody ever think about that question? Does anyone, uh, Kathy, do you have a question? Cause you have a little hand up. Yes, because what you just said about what happened in the land of Israel made me think that the three major holidays are pilgrimage festivals. Yes. So is yes. it right that you also have to go to Jerusalem, kind right, of. Right, right. So, but you're living in the land of Israel. Do you know what I mean? Like yes. in other words, you're coming from Haifa and Tel Aviv and whatever. You're making your pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you know? But yes, it's like it shows you like a very, you know, important part to the Kedusha. Okay, amazing. So now yeah. what? Yeah, sure. What about, what about in Purim that Hashem is, is hidden? So we can't sing his praises if he's okay. Hidden. That can also be a reason. That can also be a reason. But, but I mean, I didn't see it written down, but it's a very legitimate point. It's like a nice point. Okay, beautiful, beautiful, Sandy. Okay, now these six chapters. Now we got to really think. Okay, so put your thinking cap on. These six chapters epitomize the course of Jewish history, which parallels the life of David Amel. Okay, so that's interesting. So it's going to talk about six important points in Jewish history. And you're going to see that David Amelech has a similar reality to these points. And I think that in many ways, the individual journey parallels a lot of times the collective journey. Do you know what I mean? Like the Jewish people as a whole our history is very up and down and up and down and up and down. And I would say in our own lives, life is very up and down and up and down and up and down, right? You got to navigate the course, right? To have, you have to navigate the highs and the lows, both, should I mean? To stay what I would say in balance, right? That's what we really, really want at the end. You want to be able to say in the end, I was a balanced, I had a balanced reality. It wasn't over the top this way. It wasn't over the top that way. I put it in balance, right? Because when you have balance, what do you have? Stability. And if you're ever tipped too much on either side, then that's when you fall over. So really that's like, you want the body and soul in balance. You want your emotional well-being in balance. You want your mental health in balance like it's an interesting idea so if you take a look at this you're going to see similarities so David Amelech and the Jewish people have incredibly humble beginnings okay they have very humble beginnings David Amelech has a very hard childhood and you know when um, Shmuel comes to anoint Hashem says go to the house of Yishai and you will see who will be the king and you should anoint him, right? So we said like, there's like seven sons, you know, they're all good looking and this and that, and this one thinks it's the king and this, and, and not, not any of them are, they're none of them. Like Shmuel's looking going, I don't understand this. Like Hashem told me, then he says to Yishai, 
by any chance you have another son? Because <laughs> you, know? you didn't line him up even. So he goes, well, yeah, we have this like little, uh, like we're not so, uh, you know, we kind of hide this guy, okay? We're not, uh, they weren't so sure about his lineage. You know, was he, like they, there was a little bit of a question of when he was born and if his mother had, you know, been with someone else. And so there was always like this little stain around David Amelech, you know? So he was kind of an outcast. So when the Jewish people, you know, come into the picture and they go down into Egypt, so they start off, you know, pretty good, but then they're completely into slavery, right? They're the lowest of the low, you know, like when we, like when my husband does the, the Jewish history, it's like scary, like in the middle ages, there's like one of the worst periods of Jewish history. We are the lowest of the low. So they had like serfs, remember when you learn, you learn history? So they had these like feudal lords and you have a little bit of land. And then there's the lowest people in those days were the serfs, but below the serfs were the Jews. Okay. So we have these like real humble beginnings, just like David HaMelech, right? We're oppressed and it's not great. And then suddenly we get taken out of Mitzrayim and now we're the kings and the priests of the world, okay? So at that moment of the 10 commandments at Har Sinai, the world is rocking, right? And the Jewish people are now, whoa, whoa, whoa. And we have become incredible. So if you look in the Tehillim, in the Hallel, so if you look in 118 verse 22, so it says, the stone which the builders despised has become the chief cornerstone. So I remember once hearing a really beautiful, it was like a famous story with these three brothers and um, they became very wealthy. Two became very wealthy. They were bankers in Switzerland. Like the amount of money that they had was beyond. But they gave up all of their Judaism. They were from an Orthodox family, but they said, forget it. Like I'd rather be a gazillionaire than, you know, I <laughs> have to worry about this. And the other brother was an accountant. The third brother stayed religious and he was an accountant. And they always kind of like teased him. Like they used to think he was such an idiot. Like you gave up all of this for what? You know what I mean? For what? Like you could have been like us living in Switzerland in the chalet with, with billions. Like they were billionaires, okay? And they always thought he was a nothing. Anyway, they didn't have so much to do with him. Like he became the joke of the family. He lives in New York, they're up in Switzerland. But as time progresses, people get older, right? So the oldest brother was on his deathbed and he calls him up and he says, listen, I'm dying. I want you to come to speak to me. So he comes, you know, it's his brother. He's going to come to see him. So the brother looks at him and he says, I got to tell you, in the end, I really don't have nachas. My kids, I think I spoiled them. They're the biggest brats. They couldn't care less about me. They haven't really gotten married. They do nothing. They party their heads off. They all have their, you know, fancy Jaguar and their beautiful mansions, but they're not really good people. You know, and I'm sitting here thinking, I don't know, did I make a mistake? Is there a world to come? So I want to buy your portion. Do you believe this? Like, I could believe this. You know, I actually, like, the true story, but I could believe it. The guy turned to him and he said, please, like, I'll give you as much money as you want. Just give me your portion to the world to come. And the brother said, I'm like, so sorry. It's not for sale. You know? <laughs> It's not for sale. It's more precious than anything, right? So they tell a story that this, you know, he passes on and who knows whatever his life is. And he goes back to New York and he actually takes like some tzedakah money that he had and he gives it towards building a yeshiva, okay? And they have pictures of this man with the biggest smile on his face. Like he's so happy that he passed over all that money, didn't care at all. And he's you know, building the bottom, like, you know, when they're digging up, like, you know, when you get that picture with you with the shovel at the foundation, and he says this board, the stone which the builders despised has become the chief cornerstone. Here, his brother who despised him, thought he was like such a nothing, you know what I mean? What an idiot. At the end, you see, right? He becomes the real foundation and the brother in the end understood what really was valuable. It's just like important for us to, to see, okay? So this is the same thing with him. This happened to David Amelech. He was the despised stone. He was like the nothing of the family, right? And then he says in the Tehillim, 
and Hashem raises me up and I become the foundation of the kingdom of the Jewish people. So this is supposed to, what's this supposed to do for you when you say this, like Evan Masu Habonim? What are we supposed to say? What are we supposed to be feeling when we say that sentence? Sometimes that's how we feel. Who are we? You know, it, it was interesting. Somebody um, said to me, uh, I think it was one of my kids, like they said to me, you know, I hope Jody gave you a bracha. So I said, what do you mean? She said, I hope Jody gave you a bracha. Because she said, you know, you walk around in this world, do you know who the angels are who are really? Like, do you know who really someone is? It was such a beautiful thought. And that's this idea. You know, sometimes like you're looking at yourself or you're looking at other people and you're like, look with a little bit of disdain. You may not even mean to, but man, they're such a loser and that book. Who are they? You know, what, what do they do? What do they accomplish? Well, my son and Shem says, yeah, those are the ones. <laughs> okay. Like, could you imagine what people would say about David and Melech? Like, if you were really honest, like, I'm sure it was the gossip of the town. The same with Rus. You know what I mean? The same with a lot of people that were really, they were looked down at. It wasn't like, wow, the prince. It was like, right? And then you see Hashem lifts them up. So this, this is a beautiful thing for all of us, right? Sometimes you don't feel like, you know, sometimes you have these days and you don't feel like a real good mother, you know, like your kid says something to you like, you're so stupid. <laughs> I don't love you. And then suddenly they turn around and go, sorry, you're really the best mother ever. <laughs> okay, so that's this kind of idea. Okay. Same thing at work, right? Everywhere, like where you see, right? Okay, you could be raised up. Okay, so he, re he ends up ascending to the throne after being rejected as an outcast. So David was an outcast for 23 years. Oh my gosh. Like, if you think about that, like for 23 years of his life, he was erroneously thought to be illegitimate. Could you imagine? It was only when Shmuel came and anointed him as king as his true identity was revealed, okay? So this is also, if you look inside the Tehillim, it's beautiful words. He raises the needy from the dust, from the trash heap. He lifts the destitute, okay? So this is what it is. Sometimes like people who were so down, <laughs> okay, lahavdil a hundred times, but I remember once listening to Tony Robbins. Do you know who Tony Robbins is? Anybody know who Tony Robbins is? <laughs> okay, so he's this like big worldwide, you know, life coach, inspirational speaker, made millions of dollars. Do you know that he was homeless? He was homeless. He was a nothing. He said he was a nothing. He had, didn't have money for rent. He lived in the streets, right? And then he like, worked on himself and raised from the dust, you know, like it's just an interesting idea, okay? And what happens? Does David Melech say, look, I was in this dust, I was in the garbage, refuse heap means sitting in garbage, okay? I was in the garbage. The reason why they made David and Melech a shepherd, does anybody know why? Why did his family say, you know what, best if you become a shepherd? Anybody know? So we're 23 years Why? Nobody would see him. Okay, so nobody would see him. And the yes, animals don't oh, yes, judge right. no one. What? The animals it, don't judge no one. Yeah, okay, animals don't judge no one. But Talia said something very interesting. They actually hoped he would die. Because if he was out by himself, could you imagine? Like they hoped like a fox would come, a bear would come. They would attack him, attack the sheep, a lion. And this way he would like, you know, die of what's it called? Uh, normal causes. Do you see what I mean? Natural causes. Okay, so that's what he is. Then what does he say Hashem can do? I got picked up from the garbage to, to be set with the great and the great men of his people. Like it's, it's, you know what I mean? It's completely a night and day. Okay, so that's us. So the Jewish people have very humble beginnings and then they become the chosen people. So it's something for us to appreciate, okay? So that's, um, we have the humble beginnings. Then we have that we get picked up from the garbage. And then the Jews, they call to Hashem. It says in 116 that the people call to Hashem in their anguish in Mitzrayim, okay? So what is that? 
they were in a lot of trouble. There was a terrible sorrow, right? They, it looks like everything is going to be so bad. And what happens? Hashem saves them. He takes them out. I invoke the name of the Lord and, it's, and you yell out, save my life. And he does. And that's the same thing you will see with him, with David and Melech, like over and over and over and over and over again. That's the theme in Tehillim. That's the major theme. The major theme in Tehillim is I'm in trouble. Okay. I'm in trouble. Things aren't good. People are after me. This is happening. That's happening. But I am still singing your praises. This is amazing. You know what? Talia just sent me such a nice thing. She said, maybe it was the start of making King David. Oh, okay. Religious, close, being close to Hashem, right? Because when you're down and out, that's when you have to call out, right? That's your choice. Like, I, I really feel badly. Like, I, I, nothing hurts me more is that when I see people who are in big service actually turn away from Hashem. I feel like you just cut your nose to spite your face, you know, like they just, and it, it happens a lot sometimes, and it's painful for me, like it's, I can't believe, I can't believe, no, you can believe, it's just hard, but you can, and if you would, it would be so much better for you, right, so it's just interesting, so here's the same idea, so you're always calling out, you're singing um, praises. He always sings praises that Hashem saved him, all right? And that's important for us. And just like David and Melech survived unthinkable per per uh, persecution, so the Jewish people. And just like David and Melech knows, like Melech and Mashiach, it will all come back. Okay, this is real history. So it's not like a fantasy that's one thing i like about this concept of mashiach okay we don't talk about uh, mashiach as if there was never such a reality shlomo melech right there was a reality of what we talk about the future would be like do you know what i'm saying so it's like it's easier to be able to hold on to it and just like we say david you know david melech that song you know chai vikayam <laughs> david melech will live forever so too will the jewish people live forever like there is a destiny that's intertwined so i think that that's like such a beautiful idea okay so now when you are looking at this the whole basis of tehillim this is very important for us is for us to really understand and this is something that tehillim is prayer don't like they're not like most of the prayer that you say every morning is full of just Tehillim. Ashrei is probably one of the most pivotal pairs we say. Say it by Mincha and say it by this and say you say it in Shvon Esra, you say it in Shachris twice. Like Ashrei is really a heavy duty. It's from Tehillim. Okay. So they say, like, if you had to take all of the Tehillim and you had to take all of these different prayers, you put it together, it would come to this word, What do those words mean? What does the words poseach es yotecha umaspia lechol chayratzon? Anybody know? Open your arms. Yeah, it, it's more than that. See, it's it's more than open your arms. Like, I'm glad you said that, Leora, because I think most of us think that's how you translate it. Open your arms is what? It's a request, right? Open your arms. Doesn't that sound like a request? Yes or no? Yes. No, Proseach is not open your arms. It's a statement. It's a fact. It's okay. you open your arms. It's not, please open your arms, open your arms. No, it's you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. It's a statement. So when you're like feeling lost, you're feeling down. That's what Tehillim is saying. Remember we talked about the sticky notes? So this is a good one. You, you, Hashem, you open your hands and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So what am I saying when I'm making that statement? That's, it's a statement. What's, what's that? What's, what, what am I saying with that statement? An affirmation. What am I affirming? God, you provide us with everything we need. Right. So when I'm down and out and I make that statement, what am I saying? 
whatever oh, we need right bring. now will come from you. Beautiful. I think we got to say it a lot more often because I think we get very anxious. You know, people get anxious, they get worried, they're wondering what's going to be, when's going to happen. And it's big. It's big. It's like you open your hands, you provide for every li living thing. You know, they, they tell you, like they, the rabbis explain it. What's every little thing? The egg of a lice. <laughs> okay. Do you know how microscopic that is to a dinosaur? Shem feeds it all. Like imagine the egg of a lice, what, what it needs, probably a, right? And then what you have to feed a rhinoceros, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I mean, like, whoa, you know, egg of a lice and the world's population, you know, like, whoa. Okay, so this is a lot, okay? So we are saying you provide, and that's like the biggest statement. That's what we have to say. So you provide mental health and you provide satisfaction and you provide, you know, like, you know, someone was telling me today, like they get panic attacks, like class for Shalom, you know how scary panic attacks are, they're terrible. So that's where they're coming up with these affirmations. I don't have to worry, you know, I don't have to worry. That's what Tehillim is trying to tell you. Devon Amel is trying to show you. I've been through it all. Okay. I lost my children. I was a nothing. I was chased by my own son. Like, name, name a problem. You know what I'm saying? And then David Melch can say, oh, I had it, right? Sickness. Like, what didn't the guy have, Nebuch? What didn't he have? Like, um, like, what always makes me, like, the most nauseous is, like, his own son tries to kill him to take the throne. Like, I can't even imagine. Do you, like, can you imagine such a thing? Like, is there Khalila anything worse than that? Your own son. Like, what do you do, Davin? He should die. Like, what do you do? You know what I mean? Like, as a parent, as a person, as a, like, it's incredible, right? So this is big, big stuff. And I think it's like, just so, did David write anything when he was dying? I think that Tehillim is, he's, I mean, it's throughout his life. You know what I mean? Like someone just asked me that question, but I think it's throughout his life. And David Amalek was really trying to live longer. He knew he only had 70 years. That's not a long life. You know what I mean? Like comparative to many other great tzaddikim, right? So he was trying to live longer. He was trying. So the Torah tells you um, he knew he was going to die on a Shabbos and he knew he was going to die in his 70th year. So to extend life, the Torah tells you keep learning Torah. So he was trying and trying and trying and trying every day, never again, like, you know, like, and then the Satan, which is also the Eight Sahara and the Malach Amavis, it's one angel with three hats. He rustled leaves in a tree and for a second he looked up and that was it. Anyway, it's just interesting. Okay, so this is very important. And the fact that he provides, let's say it one more time, right? For every living thing means me too. So, you know, between the little egg of the lice and the giant rhinoceros is us. <laughs> we are every living thing. So this means that there's a lot of personal and private hashkacha practice. And that's something that we really need to believe. That Hashem really cares about each and every one of us. When you're opening that to Hillim, David and Malchus saying, he does, he does, he does, he does. Wait here. I'm going up to Shemayim, okay? <laughs> and I'm advocating for you, okay? And Hashem is like stopping all the angels from singing. Stop, you know, there's this crazy group down there singing 121, okay? <laughs> I want to hear it, okay? Do you see what I'm saying? So that's something I think like it's so tough. Like you want to believe it when things are all going good. You're like, thanks, that's great, God. But when things are not going good, to really believe that this is hashkacha pratis, like this wasn't, nothing here was accidents, everything is happening the way it's supposed to be happening, and I will provide for you. What will I provide? The strength and the know how and the skill set and everything else to get you through this challenge, as long as what? You recognize that I am your provider. Do you see? That's the, that's the, connecting element is that you need to recognize that fact you need to articulate that fact and you need to do it i'm going to tell you now even if you don't believe it fake it till you make it sometimes the fear is so great you can't even think straight right 
So just fake it till you make it. The Kishnam says, that's okay. You can fake all you want because down deep, that is who you are and it will bring it up. And that's what I think like so hard when you're dealing with different people and different Jews. I really feel though in the end, that Pintal Yid is down deep in every single Jew. I don't care what, how they act, how they think, how they this. I know down deep, it's there. Do you know what I mean? It is there. It is there, right? So that's what the Torah is telling you. Even if you, like in this moment, you don't exactly feel it. You're, you're so frightened that just lean on Hashem. I know you're the provider. I want to believe you're the provider. I'm trying to believe you're the provider. Do not cut your nose to spite your face. Okay? Okay, beautiful. So this is the thing that we really have to understand because you see it, especially in um, the world that we live in right now. Okay, so we're in a very interesting place, right? And Hashem is really like shaking everything up and he's trying to sort of get people to turn to really realize like a lot of the institutions that people put a lot of their faith in are crumbling, <laughs> okay? They are, okay? So it's, it's really the truth and there's nothing that we can do, okay? This is really, I think, part of the messianic plan. So yes, there's very bad inflation and like I said, crime and many other things that are just they're tumbling, right? Even COVID was such a wackadoodle, right? That went around the world that people just couldn't understand. Like, what do you mean? We always can control everything. What's going on here, right? So Hashem is kind of like moving things around. He's literally humbling us and we have to be smart. So instead of panicking and getting scared, we can say, you know what, Hashem, this is all your hashkacha practice and you will provide. Right? And I will believe in you. And I, I want to make others believe in you. I want to spread this idea, right? I don't want to believe in my genius. And like, I think the whole concept now is like, you know, money, this is going to be an issue. People really believe a lot in their money. Like everyone thinks, you know, money will save them. But I don't know. I have no idea what's coming up, right? So this is trying to show you, all right? So it's interesting. If you're going to look into the um, Tehillim, you're going to see that he, like, um, that there's beautiful words, very beautiful words, where it talks about like Hashem, ki Hashem Elokeinu Makbi Lashavis, like He is so high. Oh no, I was listening to a shear, so it's an hour, so it's in my oh, stuff. Sorry, I don't know who that was. <laughs> 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 Almost done. Five minutes. Come on in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Poor girl. Okay, you know, when that happens, you don't know. Okay, <laughs> you know, it's such a shame. Okay, anyway, so it just talks about, we only have a few more minutes. And what it talks about is this concept of Hashem, like he's, you know, very, very high, but he will humble himself to come down to the world and be with us and to, to connect with us and look at us as individuals. Because in the past, like that was a good excuse. People love to say this, like, you know, God's way above us, you know, like the, the whole idea, you know, when uh, on the Fiddler on the Roof, you know, when Tobia says, I know you're busy with wars and all this kind of stuff. You have so much more to do. Who am I? You know, I'm a little goonish, you know, by the way, if you have a minute, you know what I mean? right? So this is the general feeling, you know, that's what brought this whole concept of a vote of Zara. Like, like, you know, these people would think like God's so high and mighty, like, where would he even care about us? So the this to him, and David Amalfa addresses it and he says, you know what, yeah, he may be very high and mighty, but no, there's no greater pleasure for Hashem than to humble himself, so to speak, and to be with us and to care over us. Okay, so it's just like a, a very nice idea. So never think like, that's what I love. Like each and every one of us, you're all going to have your own little personal conversation with Hashem, right? You can call him 24-7. I don't get to hear what you're talking about. You don't get to hear what I'm talking about. You can address Hashem in a hundred million ways, like daddy and whatever, or king or whatever way you want. Like there's something incredible about that fact, right? There's something incredible about the fact that the master of the universe is caring about each and every one of us. And we can have our own personal conversation with him whenever we want. And this is what this Tehillim is trying to say. So guess what? That's a real joyful reality. Like that's a really big praise. 
you know, that's a big praise. You know, when people who are very great, like when they talk about Moshe Rabbeinu or Chaim Kanievsky, these great rabbis, what was so great about them is that they don't hold of themselves. They're very happy to just talk to you and be with you. And they don't look at you as like, ew, right? Where you can see there's a lot of snobbery when you look at the world, okay? And there, there's a lot of people who are very wealthy and they look down at other people. Okay, politicians who would be like, don't come near me, you're deplorable. Do you know what I'm trying to say? You have to appreciate this. You have to like, this is something that can give you a lot, a lot of joy, okay? And that we shouldn't like think, like Rambam said, this was a big mistake that many of the nations made. And I don't know if it was subconsciously deliberate so they could run off and do what they want to do. <laughs> you know, like sometimes like, oh, they're such a snob. They're not interested in me. Now I can do what I want, you know? So it could be, but Rambam says you have to be very careful. And that's why in this Tehillim, um, uh, David Amel goes out of his way to really show you that Hashem, even though creator of the world and all this amazing stuff, cares about you. Okay, so it's just a nice idea. So we're going to like stop here. This is like, I love this stuff. I hope you guys like it. It's just a very beautiful, you know, understanding of Hallel. And then we'll, you know, get more by the words. But right now, this is like the bigger, broader perspective. So I'm writing over here, stopped. Okay, so I think we should do for this week and like uh, an, a Leah to Jody's Nishama and everyone else that we were gonna do the thank you prayer, yeah? And that one to Hillen. I thought that was a beautiful idea, it was Tatcha's idea. And I thought that was very nice. So I am going to stop recording, okay? Um, and did it stop? Doesn't look like it.